Welcome to The Art of Discernment, a podcast where professors from across the Master's University discuss current events and higher education from a biblical worldview. Hello, this is Dr. Bob Dixon. I'm here with Professor Matt Green, a very good friend of mine and co-laborer in the communication department here at Masters. Matt Green, you are a producer, director, writer, and fortunately for me, a professor here at the University of Cinema and Digital Arts. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Well, I'm going to jump right in because you and I have these conversations a lot, and I've been eager to get you in studio to ask it for our audience. So here we go. Matt. What are some of the ingredients that you say make a good movie? First and foremost, a lot of money. No, uh, that's, what, that's what we all want you right now. Uh, okay, so that's a, obviously a, a very big conversation, right? What makes a good movie is um, probably subjective to a lot of people, but I think there's some, there's some key things that we can kind of pull out. The first is good script. Right, you have a good script, you have good characters, you have good visuals, all those different things, sound, uh, music, all those things play into what's a good movie. Ultimately, all that stuff, though, starts with one thing, and that's the story. You know, Is it a good story? Uh, does the story have, and, and what makes a good story, there's a lot of different stuff into that. David Mamet, a very famous playwright, director, filmmaker, in one of his books talks about the key to a good script or a good story is subtext. So oftentimes people think that with story, it's what's written. What subtext is, is what's not written, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's really where so much of character development is, is built. Why is that? And that's because that involves interaction with the audience because it's what's not said, right? Right. Uh, and so that's, I think, to me, one of the most powerful things. You and I talk about that a lot, which is, you know, what's not said. Because sometimes people go, well, shouldn't you say, I think you need to have this line here so that it's crystal clear to the audience. And what does that do? The audience is not as dumb as you think they are. Right. You let them interact, let them, give them some credit that they'll understand what's going on with the story. And, and that plays into that. Uh, so story is, is key, right? It's got to be a good story. Now there's films that the stories are like, eh, so-so, right? Right. Um, but we still love the movie. Why? Well, that's because maybe it's the actor who's in it is extremely charismatic or likable, and they just click in the role. Um, or it's just, it's got, well, let's take, you know, I was watching Endgame, uh, the Marvel Endgame the other night. And is the story, you know, they're all basically the same, right? But there's so much built in. You've got 10 years a vested interest mm -hmm. in these films, right? With these characters. And when all of those people come together, it's it's movie magic, right? Right. And and so you feel like I still, I've seen the movie, I don't know how many times, I still get chills in certain moments when certain things happen in that movie. So uh, again, it is, story is king, um, but there are other factors that can make a movie good. So I'm going to put you on the spot, which I know you just love when I, I do that. I do love that because I like doing that to other people. <laughs> right. So here it is. Are you ready? Uh, yes. Has there been a movie? I know there have. So maybe one or two movies in your life where you've walked out and said, now that was an amazing story. Yes. So I remember sitting in the theater in 85 and seeing Back to the Future opening weekend. And as a young kid realizing okay, this is what I want to do um, because I was so captivated by the story. Now being an adult and teaching, you know, a, a class on screenwriting, that's one of the go-tos that I use in terms of it basically being a perfect script. It is, and from a story structure standpoint, brilliant. Everything that is set up in the beginning of that film is paid off at the end. Uh, oftentimes you see things paid off at the end and is never set up or they come out of nowhere. And so uh, it's excellent um, in, in terms of just everything. It checks off all those boxes. Yeah, I've heard you say this to me a few times talking about a movie that maybe we watched over the weekend or something and you'll say, yeah, there's this moment and it didn't feel like they earned that moment. You yeah. Know, whatever the supposed payoff of that, of that scene They're was all, supposed so to it's, be. Those are, becomes, uh, those are movies of convenience. And you see a lot of those. Um, I, I think that even with like uh, the last Star Wars film that came out, it, it, again, things would just happen so they could move on to the next point, right? right. So it really wasn't about, okay, let's, let's build the story, each scene building upon 
the next one. It's okay. How can we get to the next thing? Okay. Yeah. Let's just make that happen. Uh, Back to the Future 2 is an interesting film because typically your lead character, which is Marty McFly in this film, has a character arc. Well, in that movie, the lead character does not have a character arc. Marty McFly is the same person in the beginning that he is at the end. And it's everybody else that has the character arc throughout that film, which is really interesting. That doesn't typically happen. No. Let's change gears a bit and talk about faith-based films because there's I see a lot more of them now than than I used to. Is that am I imagining that or is that, no, is that no. true? Yeah, definitely. Uh, there's been a big boom and a lot of that happened with, you know, Passion of the Christ when that came out. That was a huge success. Um studios went, oh my goodness, there's a market for these. (laughs) And so money speaks to, you know, a lot of these studios. And so you've seen a big boom in regards to, now also a lot of it is the fact too, that it's relatively cheaper to make a movie now. And so people who, um, you know, uh, couldn't afford it before can afford to make a film now. Uh, The cost is, you know, if if you're wise and, and smart with how you go about it, you can do one for honestly next to nothing. And so because of that, I won't say been inundated, but there's definitely been a growth in the marketplace and studios have taken notice. Uh, and there's, you know, Lionsgate now has, um, has usually does at least one or two faith films a year that they distribute. Sony has a whole faith division, a firm. Um, there's, uh, and then in terms of streaming platforms, you have Pure Flix. Uh, and so, uh, then you have the new series, The Chosen which um, right. is, you know, wildly popular. Um, all And all the funding for that was done through crowdfunding, uh, which is just amazing that they raised, you know, $10 million for that first season. And then I think another $10 million for the second season, all on crowdfund. So what does that tell you? Well, that tells you there's a demand for that kind of content. There's a demand for um, uplifting content that families can feel comfortable, that they don't have to preview or you know, watch ahead of time, uh, do research on to know what's what's in the content. They can sit down with their family and watch it uh, unabashedly. You know. So, what are some of the potential pitfalls of a faith based of making a faith based movie? Yeah. So, I, I think the one of the first things that we see um, with faith films is, and again, some of this comes from the fact that the very thing I was just talking about in regards to that it's it's cheaper. So, what does that do? Well, when it's cheaper. It opens the door for just about anybody to make a faith film, right? Which isn't a bad thing, um, but like anything else, has pitfalls, right? And so uh, you've got people who, you know, were realtors for forever. Well, now it's cheap to make a film. So what do they do? They go in and make a film. No no background or understanding necessarily of the very thing we were talking about, which was story, mm-hmm. right? And again, you don't have to go to school necessarily or anything like that to understand how to make a movie. But those things are helpful, to understand the theory behind how a good story is made. And so they go make a film and what do they set out? They go, I'm going to make a faith film. So what are they, what's the first thing that they set out to make? They, they set out to make a, a film that's going to have some kind of gospel moment. Right. And then the story is built around that. Okay. Whereas typically what happens with any other film, faith or secular, a writer sits out with, okay, I've got a story I want to tell. And then those moments and scenes and beats get fleshed out as they write the story. Right. So, and there are some, there are some really good films that I think that have accomplished this. Uh, but what would be ideal is that you set out to tell a good story about redemption, forgiveness, and then those moments flow organically out of that story. Uh, so it doesn't feel like, hey, I'm watching a movie. Oh, and, okay, we're going to take a five-minute break so we can have uh, a come-to-Jesus scene. Okay, and we're back into the story. Right. You know, it it, yeah. it it takes you out of that moment. And then the impact isn't as strong. You know how it is when you go see a movie and it builds and builds and builds to that dramatic, climactic scene. And, I, okay, let's let's take a film, for example. Let's take Ben-Hur. Okay. okay. So I talk about this movie a lot because I think it's one of the best faith films ever made, even though I don't know that it was intended to be that way. Okay, but it's a story about redemption, right? And in this movie, you never see uh, the face of Christ. Uh, you actually never hear Christ speak. Uh, you actually just hear people talk about what he said. Okay, uh, which I uh, respect and appreciate the reverence mm-hmm. that is displayed for who Christ is in that. And so all of this builds. It's a you know four hour movie, 
and it builds to Judah Ben-Hur's moment at the foot of the cross, right? Right. Okay, so all of that builds to that. It's It happens organically out of the story. And when it does that, and it lands at that moment, it carries so much more weight and impact. Well, you talked about subtext, and if you don't have that and you just step on the line in just a, a, a normal scene, typical scene, it takes something away from the audience. Now, in a faith-based film, it's more of a challenge to, how do I get a redemption story in subtext? Or how okay. do I get a... And so that's a great point too, because when you know we talk about a lot, when you go to set out any film, you need to first know is who's your audience. Okay. So for a faith film, who's going to be your audience? It's going to be Christians. Right. Okay. So guess what? A salvation moment is a personal experience. So that's going to be different for every single person. So to try and replicate that on screen when something that's so spiritual is really a challenge to do, to pull off you know, and make authentic. Right. To and feel so, honest. Yes. And so, and, and then you're already, again, Christians. Again, it's not that unsaved people won't necessarily watch a faith film, but if it's a hardcore faith film, the odds of them actually watching it are slim. Okay. And, and so the idea then is to, is to what is to encourage is to build up the body, um, toward, you know, with uplifting, redeeming content that has some kind of biblical worldview in it. That's again, just designed to encourage. Right. Um, yeah. and I don't know that again, faith films are necessarily going to save somebody. It might, it might be something the Lord uses. Um, but I, I think it's it's about bringing, being a, uh, another tool for Christians to use in the community uh, to build up. Now, you were involved, heavily involved in your own faith-based film, our own faith-based film here at the Master's University, The Man from Nowhere. Yes. Uh, and by by involved, I mean you wrote, co-wrote it, directed it, produced it. Talk a bit about and I might add, in eight days. So at least the production part of in eight yep. days, uh, the filming, shooting part in eight days. Talk a bit about your approach to that story and how and your and, and what you want to achieve with that movie. Yeah. Okay. So obviously, I'm a son and a father, and uh, that's a, definitely an underserved market in the faith community. And so I wanted to, you know, tell a story about that. Um, my my father and I are very similar. And so growing up, we kind of butted heads. We have a great relationship now, very close. Um, and I have two sons. And so uh, just, and, and my youngest and I are very similar. <laughs> and we, <laughs> it's we, funny how we, that works. Yeah, yeah. I know, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I know there's value in the time that I have, which is short. And, you know, we seek after, uh, all of us, you know, do seek after a lot of things that are just a waste of time. And I don't want to look back on my life and go, man, I wish I would have done this and that. I know that my time is short. And so we wanted to tell a story about that. Uh, we wanted to do it in a unique kind of way, too. So our film has some fantasy elements in it, which you don't typically see within the faith genre. We incorporated this whole noir. I love 1930s, 40s film noir. Mm -hmm. We wanted to incorporate that and have kind of this, you know, fantasy, and it almost kind of melds over into each other as the father and son story. Because yes. there's a father and son story in real life, and then there's a father and son story in the noir, which is part of a it's book. A in parallel the story that exactly runs at the same time. Yeah. And so um, we wanted to be able to kind of, you know, have some fun with that. And so when I sat down and I asked um, the co-writer of the, the script and one of the co-producers on the film, Chris Dowling, to uh, you know, help me flesh it out and really fine tune it. Um, he was really able to breathe some extra life into that and really kind of make it. I got the bones on there, but he really made it a script. So, well, there's not, I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen the movie, but uh, which is available, might I add, shameless plug, uh, manfromnowheremovie.com or Amazon. So, okay, yes. no, or Christian Cinema. You can rent it at a lot of different places. That's right. The manfromnowheremovie.com. Yes, right. The, there are, it's just a wonderful story, a father-son story and a redemption story. And and I think you hit in that picture all the beats in, in, in that sort of subtextual way. But there's enough there where you can't miss it. But back, back to the, the, the salvation scene, we don't have an explicit salvation scene in the film. Right. Um, and I've been asked that, well, is the main character, does he get saved at the end of the film? And I've said, I to me, I don't know if in that moment he's getting saved, but he's definitely on the path towards that. You can see that journey. Yeah. 
there's a scene in the movie, and I don't even want to say what it is for those of you who haven't seen it, but I've seen it several times now, and it and it chokes me up every time. And it's a really it's the one moment in the movie where well, it's not the only one, but is is the climactic moment where you actually see an overlap between the two parallel stories. Sure, yeah. And character from one story, we can talk about from it another. At this point. I, it's you know, it's and out there, so. uh, and where the where the father in the noir piece yes. and the son in the, I guess, non-fictional piece right. um, in the quote unquote real world um, come together right. and and have that conversation that is just beautiful. I love it. Well, and, and one of the reasons we did that was because the son and the dad in real life would never be able to have that moment. It just wasn't going to happen. Right. It wouldn't have felt natural if you did. No. And so, but we could do it with the fictional character Yeah, because he's not real, right? And you could have that moment. So. That's great. So so this leads to my next question. It's, it's a really important question. It's a question that I know we both get here on campus, but I'm sure our listeners uh, have entertained this as well. And that is for the Christian. Yes. What business does that person have in Hollywood, which is at least today, so certainly certainly secularized, but more than that, I would say maybe against uh, our, our worldview. Yes. Uh, what, what place does a Christian filmmaker have in that arena? Okay, so one of your famous quotes is information is what? the It's the currency of our day. That's right, okay? Or is it information or is it media? I always... It's it's both. It's okay, a, yeah. yeah. So we know that, again, COVID has made, it has shown a lot of light in regards to that, that content is how people are getting their information now, right? Right. That, that, that there's no getting around that. It's crystal clear. And I used to have to try and explain this a little more to parents would sometimes come in and go, okay, well, how does my son or daughter can, you know, should they really be going and and pursuing, you know, the arts? Um, Is that, you know, a redeemable environment? And now I have to explain that less, to be honest with you, because parents are like, oh my goodness, for the last year, they've seen the power of media, right? For good and And bad, right? Exactly, exactly. And so we, we have a God. Right, who's a creative God? You look. All you have to do is look around you, right, and see. And we are image bearers of Him. Mm-hmm. He's gifted many of us creatively, and for us to not use those gifts that He's given us, I think is sinful. Mm-hmm. Is wrong. Now that doesn't mean you have to be making movies. It doesn't mean that you have to be, you know, working in church doing videos. But you need to be using that giftedness in some capacity that is glorifying to Him. And that can look a lot of different ways. It could be film. And that doesn't mean you have to make faith films. Uh, You can be a testimony with whatever you do. Uh, So many, I work with so many people who are not believers, but they know who I am and they know the, the products that I work on, the projects that I do. And so that's opened, I can't tell you how many doors to be able to talk with people about who Christ is and, and why I, I'm in need of Christ. Uh, it's not just something that I want. I need Christ, right? And so you have this powerful medium for not, us not to try and use that as believers, I think is, is honestly, I think it's foolish. Uh, we, we need to use that because it's so powerful. Yeah, so to, to, again, even movies, for example, are a powerful way to emotionally affect other people. Yeah, we know this. We, right. we we know that that movies inform the 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 zeitgeist of the culture. I mean, we it, how the culture thinks, and it, it's the it is the forum for exchange of ideas and ideologies. Why would we give that up? And all the more reason why Christians, if they're gonna pursue whatever art they pursue, media, whatever, they need to pursue it with excellence, right? Not just do it, you know, haphazardly, but really pursue it to make sure that what they do is of quality. Because so they're taken seriously, right? They're already coming into it with, okay, here's Christians coming in doing, you know, something that's going to be cheesy or it's going to be playing in our playground. That's right. Right. So again, take away the quality component so they can't complain about that. And then make sure that whatever the the story is that you're telling is powerful. Well, you may have already begun to answer my last question for you, but I'm going to ask it anyway because I I think it's important for anybody who's listening uh, who is interested in visual storytelling, being a, making films, or perhaps they have a son or daughter who's interested in it. What advice would you give to a young, aspiring Christian filmmaker in terms of how to even get started in this? Yeah. So I, I, again, I and I think this applies to anybody who's interested in the arts. 
you can sit and you can think about and talk about. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to. Well, I'd love to write a script or I'd love to do this or I've got this thing. And I'm like, go do it. Like, why would you not just go do it? <laughs> yep. Right. What are you waiting for? And I think some of it is, well, I don't know. Well, just go do it. Once you do the first one, then the next one becomes easier. Uh, and your first one's probably not going to be very good. Okay. Fair. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Guess what? We're holding our cell phones right here. Yeah. You've got a little studio in the palm of your hand. Just go make something. My soon to be 11 year old was walking around the house the other day with his phone, just doing stuff. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm making a short film. <laughs> I said, oh, okay, awesome. Of course he is. Okay. Well, I see yeah, none of my other kids, though, have been interested in doing it. So it was kind of bizarre uh, to see him doing it. But uh, he's filming stuff and making this little film. And I said, okay, awesome. And he's like, will you help me? I said, sure. I said, how long is it? He said, it'll probably be about 15 minutes. I said, whoa, okay. Um, <laughs> 15 minutes <laughs> yeah. is a lot of film. I'm like, mm, hopefully like it's a director's cut for an 11-year-old. <laughs> but my point is, great, just go do it. Yeah. Just start making it. Mm -hmm. Why? If Because I wish I would have at 11, you know, I was interested, but I didn't have these resources right. to be able to go do this stuff. I mean, you either had a film camera or you didn't have anything. And so now you've got stuff. It's, it's never been easier just to start and to be able to start for free. And then the platform is free if you want to put That's it on right. YouTube. Go or put Vimeo it on or... YouTube. Okay. You've got, I mean, we have students. Um, one is your daughter who, again, if you're a hard worker and a hustler, there are doors that will open. And so your daughter's a great example who's somebody who just, hey, started using their giftedness and hustled and, you took, know. Took advantage of the platforms. That were which, you know, yeah. worked it on TikTok and is now crushing it, okay? That's what she didn't sit around for somebody to tell her, you know, okay, well, yeah, go do it. You could do this. She just went and did it. And so uh, that's the initiative. That's the big the big key. Take initiative and go do it. Yeah, the key ingredient of, of hustle and being willing to which put is being out lost. There. Yeah, which is being lost. I think unfortunately a lot with the younger generation. So much is being given to them. the The idea of having to go work for something is a foreign concept. That's not reality. <laughs> no, but the good news to that is that if that's true with uh, the generation, the youngest generation is coming up right now, the younger generation, then for those who are listening who say, well, how do I get an advantage in the marketplace? Well, that's an easy way to get an advantage. Don't be that. <laughs> right. Just if you even bring a smidgen of a work ethic, which you will if you're a believer, you already step in with an advantage because most people don't have that. And we hear that a lot. And if you're not as a believer, if you're not working hard, if you're lazy, then there's some kind of heart issue going on that you need to stop and evaluate. Uh, because yes, as a Christ follower, you should be known as someone who pursues excellence. So, all right, I said that was the last question. I have one final question, and that is for the students that you've seen, and you've been here, this is your seventh year teaching here at the university. It's hard to believe it's gone by so fast. I know, it's crazy. Um, and you see students come, study, then graduate, then move on. What would define for you as a professor success in terms of what your students do when once they're out into the world that they're being fulfilled personally spiritually in in what they do that they're using their giftedness to glorify him and that's that may not be what they initially think it's going to be and that's okay that's okay because again what the lord's plan for us we don't know uh, and oftentimes you know how it is when you're young you have this vision of what you're going to do mm -hmm. right and where you are now is not necessarily what that vision was 20 plus 30 years ago, right? right? Yeah. And and that's that's a good thing because again, if the Lord were to tell us the, the future, we'd probably have a freak out moment and be like, <laughs> For wait, sure. wait a second, right? <laughs> um, but you look at how we, you and I have both gotten to where we are. Um, and again, being at the university, I never 30 years ago would have thought that I was going to do that. But I'm so thankful to the Lord because A, how it's stretched me, it's grown me, um, it's matured me spiritually is awesome. So seeing the students who or anybody that I know go and use their giftedness, I think, in a way that glorifies the Lord. And again, and that can look different. It doesn't have to just be faith content, but using that in a manner that um, glorifies him is, that's that's awesome. Well, Professor Green, I'm, I'm certainly grateful that you're here using your giftedness alongside me for for the Lord's glory here on on campus, and I share your your hope for for my students as well. And I want to thank you for joining us today. And it's been it's, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Likewise, brother. Thank you for listening to the Art of Discernment. For more information on the Masters University, visit masters.edu. 
You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. We'll see you next time.